Um, so uh, doc, we are honored to have today Dr. Uh, Michael uh, Crawford. Uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Crawford is a chief of clinical uh, cardiology at UCSF Medical Center, and he specializes in training in coronary artery disease. Uh, Dr. Crawford earned a medical degree at University of California, San Francisco. He trained in internal medicine at UCSF Medical Center and Beth Israel Hospital, um, which is a part of Harvard Medical School in Boston, followed by clinical training at the University of California, San Diego, where he joined as a faculty. He was a co-director of the cardiology at the University of Texas in San Antonio and chief of cardiology at the University of New Mexico. Uh, before returning to UCSF, Dr. Crawford was a consultant and vice chair of cardiology at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Dr. Crawford has served as a chair of the Council on Clinical Cardiology of the American Heart Association and as a board member of the American College of Cardiology. He's a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a member of the Association of um, University Cardiologists and Western Association of Physicians. So we are very honored to have him um, as a grand round speaker today. And um, I would uh, leave the podium to Dr. Crawford to start with the talk now. Thank you very much, Dr. Crawford. Oh, you're welcome. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I think you see the um, slide up of the, uh, the, the, the disclaimer here for the uh, organization that's sponsoring this. And then uh, we'll move on to the talk, which is on acute coronary syndromes. Uh, we've already heard about me. I don't have any disclosures. And this is an outline of what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to start with the pathophysiology, then go on to the clinical features, uh, diagnosis and triage, which is very important, then the initial management, and then the uh, pre-discharge risk stratification and therapy. And uh, then we're going to finish up with a few brief comments on future directions what the healthcare worker should know about this topic, and what the patient should know. So let's get started here with the first module, which is the pathophysiology. So there are many causes of acute coronary syndromes, um, but by far the most common cause is atherosclerosis. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on today because it makes up 90% of cases of acute coronary syndromes. Now, uh, this is a cutaway view of an artery and you see the, uh, uh, the epicardial, uh, the epi, uh, uh, the adventitial layer here, then an internal elastic membrane, then the smooth muscle. And then if you look up here to where the, or there isn't a plaque, you see that the endothelium is right up against the internal elastic membrane and the, and the uh, smooth muscle. But when there's a cholesterol accumulation between the endothelium and the internal elastic membrane, uh, then uh, you have a plaque which in, pushes in on the lumen. Now, this, um, this cholesterol, the presence of cholesterol in the, under the endothelium like this causes leukocytes to adhere to that area and enter into the, um, here's a leukocyte here, and it enters into the uh, area here. It, and then when it goes in, there's T cell activation and phagocytosis of the cholesterol, which produces foam cells. And these uh, large foam cells are what largely what makes up the uh, cholesterol gruel that's inside of a plaque. Uh, there's also some smooth muscle migration into this area that and they become part of the mess also. Now, if there's any kind of leakage across the endothelial barrier, platelets are attracted to the area. So you often have little patches of platelets on top of the plaques as well. So this is the setup here for having an acute coronary event. Now, when you have an acute coronary event, there's 
a rupture of the plaque because the in a certain area because of inflammation that's produced uh, you get thinning of the fibrous cap and you may also have hemorrhage from uh, plaque microvessels uh, that get eroded as well. So this causes a rupture and the cholesterol gruel comes out into the artery. Now the body thinks that the artery is compromised. So platelets are attracted to this area and form a large platelet plug. And if this isn't sufficient to contain the rupture, then a thrombus is formed and as we can see in this next slide, which is a pathologic specimen from somebody that died of a myocardial infarction, here's the plaque here. It's now collapsed because the gruel is largely extruded from it. And you have a huge thrombus here, which is almost completely occluding the coronary artery. Probably in life it did. And this caused a, an acute myocardial infarction. So this is the, this is the most serious thing that can happen from a plaque rupture. Now sometimes plaques rupture in a smaller way as this pathologic specimen shows. Here you have this big cholesterol filled uh, plaque and it's ruptured a little bit here but it's just forming a platelet thrombus or what's called a white thrombus versus a red thrombus which we which you saw on the previous slide. So this patient there's compromise of the lumen of the artery and probably reduced blood flow, this patient might have unstable angina, but probably wouldn't have an acute myocardial infarction. So you have a spectrum between a, a plaques that, that are leaking and causing a platelet accumulation all the way up to full-on thrombus and occlusion of the artery. So it's quite a spectrum. And so, uh, Coronary syndrome is a large category of patients. Now the worst case scenario is the uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. And this is characterized by an increase in biomarkers such as troponin, plus greater than one millimeter of ST elevation or development of Q waves on the ECG. Then you have the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and this might have more of a white thrombus. And this also causes a troponin elevation, but now you have greater than one millimeter of ST depression rather than elevation. Or you may not have much in the way of ECG changes, but you have typical angina pectoris. And finally, there's a category called unstable angina, where the tr troponin is negative, but you may have ECG changes, um, either suggesting ischemia with, with one, one millimeter or more of ST depression, or you may have nonspecific ECG changes such as T-wave inversions, um, or you may have just chest pain syndromes without ECG or biomarker elevations. So again, it's, it's a large spectrum of problems. Now, let's stop for a minute and look at the ESC, ACC definition of an acute myocardial infarction, or this is the so-called universal definition now. So it's based on the troponin level. So you have a typical increase and gradual decrease of troponin with at least one value above the 99th percentile of the upper limit of normal. And then at least one of the following things, either classic ischemic symptoms, new Q waves or new left bundle branch block on the electrocardiogram, STT wave changes of ischemia, uh, new regional wall motion abnormalities on imaging. Of course, that, of course that presupposes that you already have an, an image on the patient before the event to, to recognize that they're new. Or finally, a uh, evidence of coronary thrombus by either angiography or autopsy. So that's the definition of MI. Now some of the problems with this definition is you can have a negative troponin and that does not exclude a myocardial infarction because troponin may not come out for several hours 
And so you need to get a second level. So if you're concerned about the patient, you don't want to just discharge them. You want to keep them for at least six hours and get another sample. <clears throat> now, an elevated troponin indicates myocardial injury, but not necessarily infarction. And so it's a very sensitive test for any kind of myocardial injury. It doesn't also, it doesn't establish the mechanism of injury. It doesn't tell you whether, what kind of a thrombus you have or whether you have a thrombus at all. You might have coronary spasm or something else going on. And it can be elevated in other conditions such as heart failure, pulmonary embolus, pericarditis, and there's a long list. So let's just look at the, the dynamics of troponin on this slide. Here we have the, the troponin level uh, here on the ordinate and on the uh, abscissa, uh, abscissa we have the hours after the acute event. Now you can see that we're going out here to 10 days. So the troponin rises in the first few hours, hits a peak uh, at around one day, and then takes 10 days to come, to come down. So this, this scale is logarithmic here, obviously. Um, now we have different troponin assays. If we go back to the 1995 assay, um, it, it wasn't very sensitive. So in order to exceed the 99% limit, you had, you had to at least be out around seven, over seven hours. Uh, to be sure you had not missed the event because it wouldn't pick up anything lower than that. Uh, in 2003, we, they came out with a more sensitive assay and now it, you only had to wait a little over four hours. And with the 2007 even higher sensitivity assay, some people were complaining that, uh, uh, claiming that you know, within three hours you could tell if you had an MI or not. And now there's a fourth assay, which uh, we're not using in the United States yet, but I think some places in Europe are using it, which is even more sensitive and you can rule out myocardial injury within two hours. Uh, that isn't shown here on this slide. So depending on which assay you're using, uh, you have to be sure and wait and get uh, a troponin level at the right time. And it's always best to have two and show that it's rising. So again, other things can cause troponin elevations, transient ischemia, cardiac contusion from an injury, a cardiac surgery, cardioversion, ablations done in the EP lab, heart failure, aortic valve disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, tachyarrhythmias, and stress cardiomyopathy or Takasubo's cardiomyopathy. Now I've bolded heart failure and tachyarrhythmias because they're very common. The other things are less common. So it can be confusing sometimes. There's also non-cardiac causes of a troponin elevation. I've highlighted in, uh, in bold the pulmonary embolus, stroke, and heavy exercise. Uh, if you do a troponin level on somebody that's just finished a marathon, I can guarantee you it's going to be elevated. So, and then there's some other rare, uh, more unusual things listed there. Okay, we'll just pause here for a second. Now we're finished with the pathophysiology. Uh, Everybody got their breath? We'll go on. So now we want to look at the diagnosis and triage. So when somebody comes in with a, a, a clinical presentation that could be acute coronary syndrome, that really begins the process. And you need to take a careful history of whether they've had any evidence of prior coronary artery disease, what risk factors they have for coronary disease, and what medications you're on that, that they're on. That can give you a clue as to what pre-existing diseases and risk factors they have. Now the electrocardiogram is extremely important uh, because this categorizes patients into whether they're an ST elevation MI or whether they're a non-ST elevation MI. And that is predicates what you do for the patient. 
And finally, as we've talked about the troponin, which can be up to a six hour delay uh, with the more recent assays. Now, classic uh, chest pain is, is uh, dull, squeezing. It's, the patients may describe tightness in the chest, pressure in the chest, and it's deep inside. It's not superficial. It's usually substernal, but any pain between the navel and the eyebrows could be due to, to myocardial ischemia. Uh, about 5% of acute MIs present with only pain below the diaphragm. So you have to be very suspicious in the right patient. It may radiate to the throat, neck, jaw, shoulders, arms, or back, or it may not radiate at all. It uh, classically, uh, anginal pain is precipitated by exercise and emotional stress, but of course with a myocardial infarction, there may be none of that. The duration of anginal pain is usually two minutes to 30 minutes. It isn't seconds. And uh, sometimes patients have a hard time figuring out how long their pain has lasted. So I usually ask them, is it seconds, is it minutes, or is it hours? And that usually helps you uh, pin it down. And sometimes uh, it's useful to ask them if the pain went away, what re relieved it? Was it just resting? Was it calming down? Did you take your spouse's nitroglycerin? Uh, that will help you pin down the diagnosis. Now the ECG uh, is very important. With ST elevation, almost everybody will have a myocardial infarction. It's, it's, uh, it's unusual to have ST elevation without myocardial injury. The, real, the only thing that really causes confusion is if they had a myocardial infarction before and they've had persistent ST elevation. But you would get the history of that, hopefully. ST depression, only half those people will have a myocardial infarction. T wave inversion is the least specific, about 5% will end up having an MI. A normal ECG doesn't rule out an MI, 6% will have a non-ST elevation MI, a few will actually have a ST elevation MI even though you can't see it, but they will have a complete thrombus of the artery. Usually these involve, when you don't see them on the ECG, they usually involve the circumflex coronary artery. Now one caveat is that deep symmetric T wave inversions across the precordium may indicate severe left anterior descending stenosis, and this has been called Wellens phenomenon. Now, if there's any doubt about the ECG, you should wait 15 to 30 minutes and get another one. And sometimes you'll be surprised at what happens. And it, it, it'll either stay the same, get normal, or become markedly abnormal, but it, it'll be helpful. Now, we talk about the pretest likelihood of disease because that's one of the ways we risk stratify patients. This is the definition of low, intermediate, and high uh, that was formulated by a governmental agency in the United States. So we use this. So you can see that 15% uh, or lower is considered low, 86% or to 100% pretest likelihood is considered high. So there's a huge intermediate zone. And that's part of the problem, is this large group of patients with an intermediate pretest likelihood. Now, when the, when the patient comes in and the pretest likelihood is low, uh, but you're still concerned about them, you could consider just doing an exercise ECG test. Uh, now this is, it, this is useful if the patient has a completely normal ECG and they exercise to at least 85% of their maximum predicted heart rate, the accuracy is up to about 85%. So that's probably adequate in a low risk patient. But if these conditions are not met, you'll need to do cardiac imaging, either ultrasound or nuclear because if they don't achieve, they don't have a normal ECG and don't achieve 85% exercise, the accuracy is way lower than 85%.
Now, if the pretest likelihood is high, then the patient needs coronary angiography. And the question is how? Well, if you could do a, a CT angiogram, um, there's less complications with this because it's non-invasive, but it does involve radiation exposure. Uh, and you can't offer the patient any treatment if it's positive. Whereas a cardiac catheterization with coronary angiography uh, has a serious event rate, uh, in other words, death or stroke, of about one in a thousand. So it's pretty low risk. And it's really the gold standard, and you can follow it immediately with therapy in, in terms of a percutaneous intervention. So usually we go to cardiac catheterization, unless there's some contraindication to it, then, then we may do a, a CT angiogram. Now, when the pretest likelihood is intermediate in the patient, then further testing is required. And again, we, ha we have the choice between a stress test, and, and this would be done with imaging in this category of patients, uh, so you get the highest accuracy. And then uh, the other uh, consideration would be a CT angiogram. So This is a uh, schema of uh, the triage of, of these patients. If we, if we start up here with a patient with chest pain syndrome, uh, the first thing we should do is get an electrocardiogram. This is often done in emergency rooms before the physician ever sees the patient, uh, just based on the whoever's triaging them at the front door. Uh, now, if it shows ST elevation, then they need to go immediately to the cardiac catheterization laboratory, or if there's time to be transferred to a place that has one, or if that's not possible, then they would be given thrombolytic therapy. So these are your ST elevation MIs. This is a whole different category of treatment because it's an immediate uh, attempt to open the artery either mechanically or pharmacologically. So I'm not gonna talk about this group anymore and focus on the more difficult to manage group that don't have ST elevation MI. It's pretty clear cut what to do here. Now, if you don't have ST elevation, if you have ST depression, that suggests ischemia. It's, a, it's fairly sensitive for that. You probably should admit that patient. If the patient has nonspecific ECG, ECG changes, you can wait around in your triage area for the troponin to come back. If it's positive, then they are admitted. If it's negative, then uh, in, in many places, they would go to a chest pain unit. Uh, and this might be a fancy unit or it might just be a corner of your emergency department. It, it varies greatly, but it, it's a place to watch the patient without bringing them into the hospital. And again, now you get your six hour troponin, or if you have the new super slick assay, maybe you could wait four hours and be fairly uh, certain of things. Uh, and if it's positive at six hours, then again, they're, they're admitted. If it's negative, uh, so now you have a patient with negative troponin, so they don't have an acute myocardial infarction, but they still might have coronary disease, they might have unstable angina. So you would, if their chest pain is gone, you would consider a stress test or a CT angiogram. If they're still having chest pain, you would of course admit them. Now, if this test turns out to be positive, then they would normally be admitted. If it's negative, then they can go home with outpatient follow-up. So there's a lot of nuances to this, but this is the general schema. Now let's talk about this intermediate non-ST elevation group here. Uh, again, it's heterogeneous. It's a large uh, proportion of patients that come in with, uh, with acute coronary syndromes. So the appropriate manage of these patients de depends on risk stratifying them. Um, and there's three categories of risk. There's the critically unstable patient, the high risk patient, and the intermediate risk patient. There's no low risk patient. It, once you have an MI, even if it's a non-ST elevation, it, there's no such thing as a low risk person. So the critically unstable patient, 
This is somebody with uncontrollable symptoms. You've given them nitroglycerin, uh, et cetera, and their symptoms are uncontrolled. Uh, they have hemodynamic instability, uh, cardiogenic shock, heart failure, worsening mitral valve regurgitation, or they're having intractable ventricular arrhythmias. So this patient gets an immediate invasive strategy. In other words, they go to the cath lab. The high risk patient uh, you, needs an invasive strategy within 24 hours. Uh, and they have high risk ECG changes, but not ST elevation. Their troponin is elevated and they have a GRACE risk score above 140. Now GRACE is an acronym. I don't remember what it stands for, but I can show you what it's about. Um, and I'll do that in a minute. Um, now the intermediate risk patient gets an invasive uh, approach within 72 hours. And this would be the patient that's a diabetic, has renal insufficiency, has a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40, is early post-infarction and having a recurrence of angina. They had a percutaneous intervention within six months. They had a, they've had a prior bypass surgery. It doesn't matter when it was. Or they have a GRACE risk score that's uh, between 109 and 140. Uh, you reference there. Um, now this is a very busy slide, and let me just point out the salient features. There's eight characteristics that go into this. The Killip class, which is a classification of how much heart failure somebody's in, from no heart failure all the way up to severe heart failure. And you get more points, the more heart failure you're in. Systolic blood pressure, the um, in this case, the lower it is, the more points you get. Heart rate, the faster it is, the more points you get. Your age, can't get away from it. The older you are, the worse your prognosis. Um, your creatinine level. And then there's three other factors. Uh, where, did you have a cardiac arrest on admission? Did you have ST segment changes on your ECG? And do you have elevated enzymes? So you put all the scores for all those things together and get the total points. And then if we look down here, you see the points across the top and you see the risk of in-hospital death across the bottom. And if we just uh, remember the eight things, kill up class, blood pressure and heart rate, age, serum creatinine, cardiac arrest, ST elevation, ST deviation of any type and increased troponin. And if we just look at the 140 cutoff for an invasive strategy, you see the risk of hospital death is almost 3%. Whereas if we go down to 109, where the intermediate cutoff is, the risk of hospital death is about 1%. So anything below 109 are people that have a less than 1% chance of dying in the hospital. So this, this, there's an online calculator for this. You can go onto the website and just quickly calculate it in your patient. Okay, now what are considered high-risk ECG changes? Well, ST depression of one millimeter or more in two contiguous leads, one doesn't count. ST elevation in two leads uh, that, that, that last less than 20 minutes. Now, sometimes the patient comes in, has ST elevation, you're getting ready to take them to the cath lab, you run another ECG, and it's gone. So something happened, they opened up their own artery, so they're high risk now, but they're not critically high risk because their artery is probably open. Um, and then T wave inversion greater than three millimeters in three limb leads or four precordial leads, excluding V1. And that's the Wellens phenomena is four precordial leads beyond V1 with deep ST invert, uh, deep T wave inversion. So don't forget about that one, it's very important. Okay, so that's the initial triage. We'll just pause for a second here, get our breath, and move on to module three, which is the initial management. Now the basic thesis of treating acute coronary syndrome is that the ischemic myocardium prefers blood to drugs. 
unless the risk of augmenting blood flow outweighs the benefits. So <clears throat> rushing a patient off to surgery to do by, a quadruple bypass in the middle of an acute MI, it pro the risk of that probably outweighs the benefit. So that's what I mean by that. <clears throat> but basically, if you can safely get open the artery and get blood back to the myocardium, that's the best thing you can do for the patient because that's what the problem is. Now, there is some standard medical therapy we do uh, to try to uh, make the uh, myocardium uh, survive better until we get the artery open. So oxygen, uh, it's commonplace in, in a lot of hospitals to see oxygen slapped on all these patients. It really doesn't do any good unless their oxygen saturation is low. If it, their oxygen saturation is normal, you actually can do more harm than good. So we sh you should do an oxygen sat uh, and if it's below 90, then give them oxygen. If it's above 90, they don't really need it. Uh, if they have persistent ischemia uh, manifested by angina, or if they have heart failure or hypertension on presentation, then nitrates are indicated. You can give them sublingually times three, uh, five minutes apart. And if that doesn't correct the problem, then you can start an intravenous drip. Uh, beta blockers are often given in the first 24 hours per oral, in other words, orally, if, if there's no contraindications to them. We'll get into that more in a minute. Um, and if beta blockers are contraindicated, you can use the rate-lowering calcium blockers for ischemia, such as diltiazem or verapamil. We usually use diltiazem uh, in the U.S. Uh, because it's a, it has a little better safety profile. Um, a high intensity statin is usually started to not so much to lower their cholesterol, but for its anti-inflammatory properties. And then if their EF is less than 40, or if they have hypertension, diabetes, or heart failure, we'll start an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, uh, depending on the situation. So this is kind of the standard package that these patients get once they're admitted. Now, we also need to deal with the clot that's forming in their artery. And remember that there's two components to it. There's the platelets, and then there's the throm thrombus. So for the platelets, we usually start uh, aspirin. Uh, usually it's given uh, either as 162 or 325 milligrams. Now that's, in the US we have an odd dosing system for aspirin. In Europe and probably the rest of the world, they use uh, increments uh, of, of 50, 75, 100, you know. So you, you have to translate that uh, to, to what's on this slide. And then after the initial load, uh, you give them 81 to 325 a day, depending on uh, what you think is appropriate. Now we often start uh, a, a, a more potent antiplatelet agent such as clopidogrel with a loading dose and then 75 milligrams a day if they're aspirin intolerant. Uh, some patients are allergic to aspirin or can't take it. And then, and then for the thrombus, we usually start unfractionated heparin with a loading dose and then an infusion for 48 hours or until the a percutaneous intervention is done. Or if uh, you don't want to use uh, an, an intravenous drug, you can use enoxaparin, which is low molecular weight heparin, subcutaneously every 12 hours, or fondaparinux subcutaneous daily uh, until percutaneous intervention is done. Or if none is done, then you, you keep this up for the duration of the hospitalization. Now that's an interesting nuance. You don't do that with the heparin, but you do do that with the uh, with either anoxaparin or fondaparinox. Um, at our hospital, we usually use unfractionated heparin because it's less expensive and it works fine, but many places prefer anox or fonda. Now, of course, the dark side of antiplatelet drugs is bleeding. That's the big risk of, of these drugs. 
And patients with major bleeding have a worse prognosis. So you don't want to induce bleeding in these patients. So a selective approach is recommended targeting the highest risk, risk patients for more aggressive therapy. Now, who has had a high risk of bleeding? Well, anybody with a history of bleeding, any evidence of bleeding on admission, such as a positive stool guaiac? Yes, you should do a rectal uh, in an acute MI patient. There's no contraindication to it. That's been studied. It doesn't make them go into VTAC or anything. So it should be done. Um, if they have a history of a recent stroke or head trauma, if there's any history of hemorrhagic stroke, if they are on a drug that's raising their INR above two, or if they have liver disease and has an, have an, uh, uh, an INR above two, if their platelets are less than 100,000, that's a contraindication to anticoagulation. Uncontrolled hypertension, because that might lead to a hemorrhagic stroke. Major surgery or trauma in the last six weeks. Liver failure, advanced renal disease, or advanced age. They don't define advanced age, but uh, there's more of a biologic determination, I think, than a number. So these are patients who you wanna be extremely careful with in terms of how much drugs you put them on to prevent platelets from aggregating and thrombus from forming. Now let's talk a little bit about the patient with an early invasive strategy. So a P2Y12 inhibitor is usually given as a loading dose and for six to 12 months afterwards if they have uh, a percutaneous intervention done. Now, in the US, we have three of these drugs available. Clopidogrel is uh, the least expensive and is used most commonly. There's also Prasugrel, which is more effective, but it has a higher incidence of bleeding. So there again, we only use Prasugrel in the highest risk patients. And then there's a third drug called Ticagrelor, which is uh, used uh, in specific situations. Um, now, that's those are drugs for inhibiting platelet aggregation. Then in terms of in inhibiting thrombus formation, uh, you can give bivalrudin as a loading dose and then an infusion until the percutaneous intervention is done. Or you can give uh, platelet glycoprotein inhibitors such as epsiximab, uh, epifitamide, and tyrofiban at the time of percutaneous intervention but not if they're on bivalrutin. So you have a choice between bivalrutin or the platelet GPIs. In our hospital, we usually use the platelet GPIs, uh, but other places prefer bivalrutin. So that's the patient that's going to the cath lab. They get one platelet inhibitor and one thrombus inhibitor. Now, let's just review again the indications for an invasive strategy refractory pain, hemodynamic instability, and otherwise high-risk patients. Now, who would you ever refer for an elective coronary bypass surgery? Uh, well, this would be patients who on angiography were found to have multivessel disease uh, that couldn't be adequately addressed with a percutaneous intervention. And, and they would be set for elective cabbage. Now this wouldn't be done immediately because the risk would be too high. So usually it's done in about a week uh, after the acute event. And during this time, uh, you have to stop your antiplatelet drug uh, five days or more before the surgery. If they're on Prasugrel, you have to stop it for seven days prior because of the higher risk of bleeding with Prasugrel. And if they're on, uh, the platelet glycoprotein inhibitors, you, stop, you can stop them two to four hours ahead of surgery. Okay, that finishes up the treatment uh, part. We'll just pause for a second here. I think we're doing okay on time. Looks like you're all still awake. Okay, now we're gonna talk about an important aspect is what to do after you've treated the patient in the hospital, the discharge risk stratification therapy and prevention. 
So pre-discharge risk stratification. So if, if uh, a stress test can be done for stable intermediate risk patients to detect ischemia, we already uh, went over that earlier. And an imaging study should be done to assess left ventricular function. Now, if you do the imaging with the stress test, then you've got two birds with one stone there. But you want to assess LV function in these patients. Now, what about additional pre-discharge therapy? Well, the patient should be sent out on sublingual nitroglycerin just in case they have a recurrence of pain. They'll have something to take to abort the attack. Um, then the uh, antiplatelet inhibitors should be given for six to 12 months if they had a stent placed in the percutaneous intervention, uh, depending on the type of stent. Uh, the newer stents, six months is adequate. The older version uh, needs 12 months. Now, if an oral anticoagulant is needed, for instance, let's say they have atrial fibrillation and they need to be on an oral anticoagulant, then you should continue the aspirin and the uh, platelet inhibitor for one month and then stop the aspirin. Uh, because the, uh, the P2Y12 inhibitor, such as clopidogrel, will, is more potent than aspirin. And aspirin not only poisons platelets, but it causes GI erosions and could lead to bleeding. And you're already on another antiplatelet agent because of the intervention that was done. So we usually, after a month, stop the aspirin. And we also give a proton pump inhibitor to these patients. And then finally, who do you give an aldosterone blocker to? Well, anyone with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40, and as long as they don't have renal dysfunction or hyperkalemia. Now, in the low-risk patient or unstable angina patient that you're discharging, and you've done an early conservative approach, in other words, they didn't go to the cath lab, they were considered too low a risk, or there were contraindications. So they should go out on uh, aspirin 325, it should be, is given initially, and then it's reduced. We usually put, send them home on 81 milligrams. Um, in Europe, that would be 75 or 100, whatever you want to pick. Um, or possibly in other parts of the world where you have the European dosing. <clears throat> and that's given indefinitely until we invent something better. Uh, usually a, um, uh, a P12Y2 inhibitor is given as well with a loading dose and then 75 milligrams a day for a year if it's clopidogrel. It's, if you pick one of the other agents, it's a different dose, obviously. And then um, Anoxaparin is often given one milligram per kilogram subcutaneously for 12 hours, uh, acute every 12 hours. Or you can give unfractionated heparin if there's renal dysfunction because that's a contraindication to anoxaparin. Usually beta blockers are given if there's no contraindications. ACE and ARB, if indicated, I went over the indications for those earlier. Appropriate lipid management, and then, very importantly, a referral to cardiac rehabilitation. So the patient leaves the hospital with a lot of things to do and take. Now let's talk about beta blockers for a minute. Um, you know, some of you, if you've been around for a while, know that back in the uh, 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 10 years ago, we used to give intravenous beta blockers as soon as the patient came in and, and was thought to have any kind of acute coronary syndrome. Well, that was shown to not be safe and uh, because beta blockers decrease heart rate, blood pressure, myocardial contractility, uh, but they also re reduce the oxygen need of the myocardium and reduce myocardial damage. But if the drop in blood pressure is excessive, then, then actually they, that reduces the blood flow to the myocardium. So that's a potential problem with beta blockers. They're also antiarrhythmic and they're of proven benefit in post-MI patients uh, long-term. But if, if they're just used uncritically early, especially IV, they can be dangerous due to bradycardia hypotension. And actually, if the patient is near shock, it'll actually precipitate shock. 
There's also no controlled trials in unstable angina with beta blockers, only with MI. Um, although many practitioners give them to patients with unstable angina. And the COMET study showed no benefit in acute STEMI, but an increased risk of shock. Um, so uh, now in that study, they gave rather high doses though, so some people criticized that study for that reason. But anyway, the guidelines, at least in the US, now recommend you start with low doses orally in the first 24 hours, in low risk patients, that means people that don't, don't look like they're gonna go into shock or, or heart failure. And you only give it IV for specific indications such as severe hypertension on admission, or perhaps rapid tachyarrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation. So uh, just to summarize, you initiate it in the first 24 hours. Uh, we usually use metoprolol or carvedilol, those have both been studied in acute MI, uh, and it's given orally, not IV. If hypertensive, you can give it IV. And it's contraindicated if there's any signs of heart failure, low output, uh, any signs that they might be going into shock. Uh, people that are elderly, uh, blood pressure less than 120, heart rate less than 60, or greater than 100. Why greater than 100? Well, because those patients are impending shock unless it's rapid atrial fibrillation or something like that. But if you just have sinus rhythm at 110 or more, uh, you're going into shock uh, usually. And if there's any evidence of high grade heart block. So beta blockers are useful if, the, if they're safe. Now in the conservative strategy patient, the low to intermediate risk patient gets a stress test uh, or a CT angiogram if stable in 12 to 24 hours. They measure the resting EF. And we usually get a lipid panel within the first 24 hours. If you do it after 24 hours, the lipid, pan, uh, the lipid values will be artificially low because uh, LDL cholesterol uh, can be depressed by uh, acute stress. But that doesn't usually happen for about a day. So if you get the lipid panel within the first day, you usually get an accurate picture of what the patient's lipids are. If you miss the first day, then you've got to wait uh, several months, up, up to three months before you can do a lipid panel and get an accurate result. But the patients go out on a, a, on a, a statin drug, as you'll see in a minute anyway. Now, one of the advantages of a CTA is it, it's highly sensitive and has a high negative predictive value. So emergency room physicians love it because if it's negative, they're home free. Uh, the patient can go home. And it's logistically easier to use than a stress test because it's usually, there's a CT scanner in most uh, emergency rooms. Uh, the disadvantages of it are that its specificity and positive predictive value are modest. So if it's positive, it doesn't help you that much. Uh, it's a relatively high radiation exposure. Uh, you often need to give beta blockers to the patient to get their heart rate below 60, because if you don't get the heart rate below 60, you don't get good pictures. And it does require contrast. Um, let's talk now about secondary prevention. You, the patient's had an event, you wanna prevent a new event. So you wanna manage their cholesterol. Uh, uh, currently, the thinking is, to get their LDL cholesterol below 70 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, I'm sorry if you use the other system. I, I don't remember the value in the other system, um, but in, in the milligrams per deciliter, it's 70. Um, control hypertension, control diabetes, smoking cessation, very important. I don't think I've ever seen a myocardial infarction in somebody less than 40 uh, who didn't have a familial hypercholesterolemia unless they were a smoker. So it's very important. Weight management. Now the issue of arthritis comes up. Most patients with a myocardial infarction are older and older people tend to have arthritis. It's very common. So, and we know that uh, these uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs can uh, cause uh, patients to have myocardial infarctions. That's one of the complications of them because of their effects on cyclooxygenase. So 
This has been studied and certain ones are felt to be safer than others. The safest is, safest is acid aminophen, uh, followed by naproxen, then silicoxib, but only if it's 400 milligrams a day or less. And then finally, drugs like ibuprofen uh, are the least desirable. So that's something to keep in mind is kind of a progression of drugs you can use to control their arthritis or make recommendations to their whatever physicians taking care of their arthritis. Okay, so hopefully the patient won't, will be prevented from having another event uh, because of your preventive therapy. So let's, let's finish up here with the last few things. Um, Future directions. Well, one of the things that's come up in the invasive strategy uh, world is that uh, do you just treat the culprit artery and then get out of there? Or do you do a total revascularization if you see other coronary lesions? Uh, it used to be thought that you did the culprit artery and got out of there, but more recent data uh, in trials in Europe have shown that uh, total revascularization actually uh, has a better long-term result. So that's an ongoing debate, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. Um, the other thing, uh, I think, is customizing antiplatelet therapy. So one of the things that, have, uh, that I mentioned about Prasugril is that although it's more effective at preventing future thrombus formation, it has a higher risk of bleeding. So to keep somebody on it for six to 12 months is, you know, is kind of uh, stress producing for the doctor. Um, so one th thing that's come up in a recent trial is to put the patient on Prasugrel for one month and then switch them to Clopidogrel for the duration of the six to 12 months that's required for whichever type of stent they have in. And the thinking is this might optimize the benefit and minimize the bleeding risk. Now, this is an observational study and, and we really need a randomized controlled trial, but this is something that's a concern is getting the right cocktail for the antiplatelet uh, treatment. And finally, there was a, a study presented uh, recently in, in 2017 on the use of a direct thrombin inhibitor in acute coronary syndrome. Uh, such as uh, the drug in question that was used in this study was rivaroxaban. Uh, there's a, a few others of these drugs available. Um, and it showed a benefit in uh, uh, long term in patients with acute coronary syndromes. So again, that's one trial with one drug. Uh, and the, the effect was not great, but it was statistically significant. So we'll have to see how that plays out here in the future. Okay, I think we're up to item six now. Let's move on. So what should a healthcare worker know about this particular topic? Well, some key metrics I think that anybody working in a healthcare uh, situation should know. If a patient comes in with chest pain or, or an equivalent to chest pain, uh, such as a pressure in their chest or difficulty breathing, uh, and, and, and they look like somebody that could have an acute coronary syndrome, then the standard of care is to do an electrocardiogram within 10 minutes. So that should be the first thing they do. Um, and then of course, the doctor should see the electrocardiogram within 10 minutes also. I've, you know, unfortunately, I've seen cases where the electrocardiogram was done, but nobody ever looked at it. So you, you don't want to avoid that problem too. So it's a two-step process for your healthcare worker. They need to do it and make sure they stick it under the doctor's nose within 10 minutes. Um, and then in, a, in an ST elevation MI, the, the key thing is getting that artery open. The sooner you get the artery open, the more likely you are to save myocardium. So, the, so we, here in the United States, we have a thing called the door to PCI time, that's, or the door to balloon time, when you blow up the balloon and open the artery and deploy the stent. And that, our standard is less than 90 minutes uh, for that. Now, of course, it doesn't take into consideration how long the patient delayed before they came into the hospital, but we don't have a lot of control over that. 
but that's that's the standard. If you don't have a cath lab in your hospital, then the they talk about the door to PCAI time being uh, less than 120 minutes. So if you can't transfer the patient within uh, 30 minutes to another facility, then uh, probably you should give thrombolytic therapy. Okay, I think we have one more thing to go. And what should your patients know? Uh, the patient should know that time is heart muscle. Sudden chest discomfort, shortness of breath, or weakness could be a heart attack, and they should get to, into a healthcare facility as quickly as possible. Uh, although sudden death can occur from a heart attack, usually there's warning symptoms, and the patient should not ignore these because the sooner the blood flow is returned to the heart, the better the prognosis. Okay, just to finish up, acute coronary syndromes are usually due to atherosclerotic plaque rupture in a coronary artery. The key to successfully managing ACS is to quickly triage the patient into the various risk groups we talked about. And the higher the risk, the more aggressive the therapy should be. Now the management is a complex balance of efforts to restore coronary blood flow with mechanical interventions or drugs and the risk of these therapies. The long-term management involves therapies to reduce coronary plaques, keep them from rupturing, and to maintain the competency of any revascularization that had been done. Thank you.